Good to see each one of you here this morning. Um, looks like a lot of people are on vacation, but uh, isn't it great to come to church on uh, the Lord's Day to worship Him? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Oh. I love Sunday. It's, uh, it's actually my favorite day of the week. I just love it. Love, it uh, love, love being able to be with God's people. Love being able to come and share the word of the Lord with everybody. Um, it's just a good day today. So let's just bow in a word of prayer before we uh, start today's message. And uh, would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to serve you. God, we come here for you this morning. Jesus, we thank you for giving yourself as a payment for our sins. Lord, you have come that we might have life and might have life to the full. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you for how you speak into our lives, how you teach us, God. Help us, God, this morning as we open the word to hear what it is that your spirit would have us to hear. God, that you would give my, my, uh, my mind, uh, your mind, Lord, so that I can speak what it is that you would have these people understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So over the past um, two weeks, I've been continuing my series of messages in the Gospel of John. And um, we continue this morning, uh, starting with John chapter 6, verse 25. Now, in this particular setting, um, for those of you who haven't been with us, Jesus had just finished rescuing his disciples from the storm on the lake, immediately after performing one of the greatest miracles uh, recorded in the New Testament of Jesus feeding thousands of people with five loaves of barley bread or bread and, and, and two fish. So we have Jesus going out onto the water in the midst of the storm and calming the seas and and um, once rescued in the middle of, of, the, of the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> once he was there in the boat with his disciples, you know what happened next? He teleported them right over to Capernaum. They found themselves in the middle of the sea, and the next thing they know it, they're right at the port. So there was another miracle of God that was performed right after he had walked out to them on the water. And there they were. They were in, um, they were in Capernaum. And uh, that's where a lot of the disciples had originated from. And Jesus did a, a great deal of his ministry out of Capernaum. So in the morning, you see, because uh, the people that had been fed by the Lord, the, the thousands of people that had gone their way after receiving the miraculous um, feed of bread and fish, in the morning, they, they, they had saw the night before the disciples cast out into the sea without Jesus, and they saw Jesus uh, go up onto the mountain to pray. So they were assuming that Jesus would be around, but they, the next morning they were looking around for him, and they couldn't find him. Where did Jesus go? They were wondering where he was. So, they went out from that place and began to go around the lake trying to figure out where he went. And they ended up finding him with his disciples in Capernaum. Because Jesus hadn't taken another boat and he hadn't walked the shoreline overnight. He had walked on the water out to his disciples. These people didn't know it, so they were looking for him. So this is where we pick up on today's message. My message today is about Jesus as the bread of life, and I'm going to talk to you about cultural Christianity in the middle of that and compare the two. So starting with verse 25 from, verse, or from chapter 6, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Interesting way of responding to people that had gone all the way around 
the Sea of Galilee to find him in Capernaum. Interesting way of responding to them. Now, out of the thousands of people who had sat down and were fed by Jesus when he performed the miracles of the loaves and the fish, most of them had actually failed to understand or grasped what the Lord was trying to do or accomplished through that miracle that he performed. They understood, they understood the direct effect of following Jesus had led to their physical needs being met by the Lord with his provision, satisfying their hunger with the loaves and the fish. They understood that. They were physically hungry. They were in a desert area, away from any stores or places where they could get food. And they had gone into the wilderness to hear what Jesus had to say. And with the miracle that Jesus had performed in satisfying their hunger, the people saw their physical needs met and it reminded them of a story that they knew of from being Jews and knowing the history of their people. In fact, the Lord, when the children of Israel were released from slavery in Egypt, had fed His children with manna from heaven. So this was on their mind. And you see, this gave them the hope I believe that Jesus would start a new trend by supernaturally providing food for them daily. That's a pretty good deal. We get to hear this guy teach, and his teachings are riveting, and we also have our bellies filled as he supplies the manna for us to eat. Well, that's what their hope was. The problem was that they weren't genuinely interested in submitting their lives to Jesus Christ. They just wanted the tag-along benefits that followers of Jesus would receive when they followed him. That's what they were interested in. The fact remains, folks, that the most, peop the most of the people in this world, they don't want to submit to the authority of God because he is God, and if they decide to come to God and recognize Him as their Heavenly Father, they embrace Christianity, but it is for other reasons. It is not because of God. It is because of certain tangible benefits that they might receive from God on the surface level. You might call the embracing of Christian thought in a move, movement without personal submission to the Lordship of Christ, you might call it cultural Christianity. It is from this perspective, friends, that our European, if for those of, of us who come from European ancestry roots, not everyone does, but for those of us who do, okay, from that perspective, the European and American nations were formed and have throughout history been referred to as Christian nations. From the time of the early church, cultural Christianity in thought was rooted in society and it spread throughout the Western world. Spread throughout the Western world. It was rooted and, and came from Israel, the land around Israel, Asia Minor and Rome, where the early church started, where Jesus started the church with his disciples. And it spread from there. There was a unique blend in history of political influence throughout Europe that had close ties with the church. And as a result, kings and other state leaders embraced Christianity as their token religion as church and state worked together to form Western society. European culture was heavily influenced by Christian principles for more than a thousand years. And the cultural influence of Christianity left its mark. And North American culture has also been heavily influenced by Christian principles because of the influential ties that we have to Christian Europe back in the day. Canada, Mexico, and the United States, the colonial systems of governance were in part founded and based on Christian principles just as it had been done in Spain and Italy, England, France, and Germany. Russia. This is why 
This is why on the American penny you have, In God We Trust, stamped on their penny. And, and, and it's why in our Canadian national anthem we sing, God keep our land glorious and free. However, this being said, from the time of the founding fathers of our country to the present day, it is a fact that many of the leaders and people of our past have embraced and promoted some of the principles of Christianity without being truly Christians. People have called our nation a Christian nation, but outside of following some of the principles of the Bible, was our nation ever really Christian, truly, from top to bottom? I mean, Christian in the way that Jesus intended. Any person, it's a fact, that honors the Lord Jesus Christ's teachings in any form, any nation that honors the Lord Jesus Christ's teachings or the teachings of Scripture in any form will reap some benefit from that. Why? Because God is the designer of everything. He knows how we function, and the Bible is the road book or the, the road map that shows us how to live a life that God intended. So if we take any one of those principles, we're going to receive benefits from it. If I'm not given over to Jesus in my heart, yet I treat people the way that I would want to be treated, there's going to be a certain blessing that's going to fall on me, and there's going to be certain benefits on me and also the people around me. People and countries have done well because they've submitted to some of God's core teachings written in the Bible, but lest we have rose-colored glasses for our Christian cultural past, let us not forget the sins of our forefathers or repeat those sins when it comes as a culture to how we have acted as a whole towards people, towards other human beings made in the image of God. It is an extremely sad reality that there is an abundance of evidence to show that historical atrocities have been committed by Canada, a Christian, cultural Christian nation. When we consider what's been done, it's heart-wrenching. What's been done under the guise of the church, under the, the shadowing supervision of of a country that's supposed to be in sync with Christianity. What am I talking about? Well, when you consider what was done to our indigenous population in the past through the residential school systems, it's horrific. Being a policeman for 25 years, I have heard stories, I've sat across the table from people who have poured out their heart and told me of atrocious things that were done to them and their families. Horrible things. Not everyone received that kind of treatment, but a lion's share of people involved in this did. Consider the British government's mandate in 1760 to reduce the population of our indigenous peoples by purposefully introducing smallpox through blankets and linens to the people. You think that I'm exaggerating? I am not exaggerating, folks. This is written in history. It's in our historical archives. Sir Geoffrey Amherst, commander of the British forces of North America, during the 1760s, discussed with Colonel Henry Bouquet a subordinate on the western frontier during the French-Indian War, and he said this. Sir Geoffrey Amhorst wrote, they're having problems with smallpox coming over to North America. And you know what he said during the Indian War that they had? Could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among those disaffected tribes of Indians? We must on this occasion use every stratagem in our power to reduce them. All of this, my friends, was done under the flag of cultural Christianity. Consider the ways our, our Christian culture treated the many thousands of Chinese workers who were slaves on the railways and gave their lives so that we could drive through tunnels to Vancouver or through to Calgary. You know how many people died 
doing this, who are unjustly treated. This is done under the flag of cultural Christianity. A Christian nation. Unless we think that the Americans to the south had it any better, look at what happened to the black slaves. Consider how that tore that country apart. How there was a giant civil war with, with so many people dying. Consider the, the slaves who were beaten and oppressed. All under the flag of cultural Christianity. Up until the 1960s, a larger percentage of the Canadian population attended church and considered themselves Christian. Laws were enforced. Good was rewarded. Bad was punished. Much of the moral law of God was revered, and the majority of people told the line. People were told to live a certain way because it was the way that we learned how to live from our grandfathers and our grandmothers. And so should be good enough for me. Being a good Christian meant towing the line and doing the right things. Many folks attended church and identified as Christians because it was good for their business. Where else could you find such a, a pool of people who could invest in your financial well-being in your business, in your life? Connections. Cultural Christianity. Crime was relatively low. The biggest problems in schools were chewing gum when you weren't supposed to or smoking in the boys' room. And it was right about the time when people started to question, well, why do we do this? Why do we go to church? Why do we follow these regulations and why do we live this way? But because we had cultural Christianity at the helm, people didn't have the answers. Because this is the way that it should be done and this is the way that society should run properly. Well, that answer wasn't good enough for them. So what did they do? They rebelled. They went out in the 60s, 70s. Whole generations of young people abandoned the church, abandoned traditional Christian morality in regards to their sexuality and how they carried themselves. They, they gave themselves into drugs and, and, and using drugs and experimentation with social systems. Everything was thrown out because the answer of historical cultural Christianity was not relationally based. It was based upon an ideology for the benefit of people, for themselves, not because they wanted to have a relationship with God. And this created a fall like we've seen. This created the cesspool that we see right now in our culture around us. Randy Stonehill, one of the Christian founders of contemporary Christian music when I was younger, he wrote this song. And he goes, this is kind of what it's like, people. Well, it's okay to murder babies, but we really ought to save the whales. We're putting criminals in office because it's way too crowded in the jails. TV is our teacher and our schools are overrun by thugs. And children skip their innocence and graduate to sex and drugs. And right is wrong and wrong is right. And white is black and black is white. I think I just lost my appetite. Stop the world, I want to get off. And then he goes, stop the world, I want to get off. This is too weird, a little too weird for me. I'm just interested in a planet where they're interested in sanity. So this is this cultural revolution where there was an abandonment of Christian principle had a negative effect. We're seeing it all around us. Look what happened in the Olympics recently with the opening ceremony. People are starting to swing with the pendulum back towards cultural Christianity. And Christians, we got to be careful that we don't follow suit with this, thinking that this is the solution that's going to save the world. Cultural Christianity has never saved the world. It never will. We need to, to stop our mind for a second and go, okay, is it wrong to embrace 
conservative values? Absolutely not. Will God bless a nation because of conservative values that they embrace? Absolutely yes. But this is not going to save people. It's not going to save people. Right now, people are tired of the backlash of the degrading of Western society. People like Jordan Peterson are intellectuals chattering about it on YouTube. I mean, I enjoy listening to some of what he says and, and, and thinks. It's, it's refreshing. He says a lot of things that are, that are good. And even Richard Dawkins, you know, one of Christianity's most vehement opponents as an atheist, has regretted to see the downfall of Christian morality. He would like to see the Christian morality without Jesus in culture, right? That's what he'd like. Yeah, well, in a recent interview, the president, former president of the United States, Donald Trump, stated, religion gives you some hope because if you believe in it, you're going to heaven. When asked if he believed, he says, I do. If I am a good person, I am going to heaven. My friends, this is cultural Christianity. It is not genuine Christianity. Christianity says that there is no one that is good, and it is by grace through faith that you are saved, and this is not of yourselves. It is not of yourselves. It is by faith and faith alone and God's grace and grace alone that you are saved. We don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. Nobody's good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven on his own merits. So let's blow the smoke screen for what it is. Cultural Christianity does not save people. It gives them an illusion of salvation. Donald Trump, Peter Polyev, or whoever, whatever politician you have out there is not going to save the world and make your life better. You might have a tinge of that but what Christianity about anyways? Friends, the reason I'm talking to you this morning about all of this is it really connects with what Jesus had to say here in the book of John. Now, I've come across an illustration that I'm going to share with you that really brings this home. Now, in 1999, there was a company called Healthy Choice Food and Snacks. And they had a promotional campaign where they offered a certain number of frequent flyer miles to whoever would buy their products. And the only catch was you had to buy their products, you had to scan the code, and you had to enter it in. And then you would get these air miles, these frequent flyer miles, for every product that you purchased. Well, for most people, they couldn't be bothered with figuring it all out, but there's this one guy named David Phillips. He did some calculations and figured, hey, I can take this to the bank. And during the promotional campaign, David Phillips discovered that each pudding cup put out by this company produced a barcode with it. And with that barcode, you could scan it. And although you'd only pay pennies for the, the cup of pudding, you'd get dollars as a, as a reward for your air miles. So in line with the rules of the promotion, Phillips produced all the pudding that he could get his hands on. It became a standing joke, actually, because people saw him loading up with as much pudding as he could come in, into. He'd go into a store and he'd clean them out. He was a standing joke that he's the pudding man. Pudding man. Ha, ha, ha. Pudding man. He really likes his pudding. 12,000 pudding cups. That's what he purchased. 12,000 pudding cups. And the reality was... Folks, the reality was that he had no interest in eating pudding. As a matter of fact, most of the pudding that he purchased, he gave straight over to the Salvation Army. He had no interest in eating pudding. But secretly, he put in claims and earned 1.3 million air miles, equivalent to 30 flights around the world plus platinum status on American Airlines for the rest of his life. He spent $3,000 approximately in pudding purchases, but received a lifetime of air travel in exchange. And those who saw David buying all of the pudding cups thought 
here's the poster boy for this company. Like he, he enjoys their product so much. Look at what he's buying. You see, if we look at cultural Christianity the way that David looked at the pudding cups, who would be the pudding cup? It would be Jesus. Jesus would be the pudding cup. With cultural Christianity, Jesus is just the means to the fulfillment of another goal. David Phillips appeared on the outside to be a lover of pudding, but he wasn't. He wasn't a lover of pudding. He was in it for another reason. He was in it for what the pudding purchases has enabled him to achieve. People who are cultural Christian do not have knowing Jesus as their goal. Jesus is just the pudding cup that enables them to gain riches for themselves or power for themselves. They may talk like sincere Christians, act like sincere Christians in some ways, speak very positively to everyone around them about Jesus, just like David spoke about the pudding company. But in reality, their approach to faith in Jesus is narcissistic. We live in a society where there's a lot of people with a narcissistic view of Christian faith. A cultural Christian may use Jesus as an icon to stand behind. They may wave a flag, display a sign, or a cross to identify themselves with Jesus when they're promoting a cause that produces something that's of their benefit. The revival of Christian values is not for the sake of knowing God and the power of his resurrection, but is an end to a means, or a means to an end. A cultural Christian may be someone who thinks Christianity is a device that gets them what they want politically, socially, or economically. People standing under the banner of Christian cultural Christianity say they embrace Christianity out of love for their country and love for the king. They want what's best for their society. They say their goal is to create a glorious society and to see their country rise as great and prosperous. But the truth is that their brand of Christianity has been reduced to a vehicle enabling them to experience blessings here and now. There is very little said about life with God, but much said about blessings from God. In this mentality, faith is about what we bring or what, what bring what. Faith is about what comes to us. What comes to us as a result of believing. But not God himself. Embracers of cultural Christianity earnestly desire a powerful, more successful country so that they can have comfort in this world, health, wealth, and prosperity wherever they go. But this is not the Christianity that Jesus or his apostles spoke about or promoted. It is very much opposite to what they were about. What they were about is if you want to gain your life in this world, you will lose it. You see, cultural Christianity is all about what I can get. True Christianity is about what I can give. In our text this morning, people were trying to find Jesus, but they had the same outlook as many people and politicians have in mind today. Jesus was a means to an end for themselves. They did not want to follow Jesus because of who he was. They wanted to follow him because of what he could give them. This is why the Lord speaks in John 6, 27, continuing. Do not work for food that spoils, he told these people, but food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. 
So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that, our, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. You see there where this is going? We can't forget that the people who had sought out Jesus at this point were the ones. They were the ones who had their fill of bread when he miraculously supplied the 5,000 men, 10,000 people. He'd given them the sign already that he was the Messiah. What more did they need to see? Yet they weren't satisfied with what they had been given as a sign to say that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They weren't satisfied with it. Because they weren't interested in genuinely, genuinely knowing Jesus. They were only interested in the health, wealth, and prosperity that he could potentially give them if they now believed in him. They would follow him if he would only continue bringing on the physical blessings. Their focus was on Jesus providing physical bread just as manna had been provided to the Israelites through the desert. And this is the same mentality that those who pursue Christianity from that cultural perspective have embraced. What sign will you perform, Jesus, that we might believe in you? Will you meet my demands? When I ask you to do something, will you do it? Give us daily bread, Jesus, in the physical. We want your blessings. We want you to give us our health and wealth and prosperity in the earth. But the bread that they desired in this, in this case was not the bread that Jesus intended for them to pursue, nor is it the bread that Jesus intends us to pursue. Jesus said to them in verse 32, Very truly I tell you, is it not Moses who... It is not Moses who had given you the bread from heaven. It is not Moses. But it is my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The true bread of heaven isn't what they ate on the mountainside. The true bread of heaven is the living Son of God who had come down to them to give his life for them. That is the true bread. It is a spiritual bread. Sir, they said, give us, always give us this bread. They didn't understand. Then Jesus declared, I am, I like that, I am the bread of life. I am. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. And here Jesus confronts the error in their thinking. Folks, it's easy for us as human beings to be led astray into error in our thinking. As human beings, we have all kinds of different perspectives that we can pursue. The heart is deceptive above all things. Oh man, our sin nature just leads us down the garden path every time. We can't always depend on how we feel. These guys, they want a bread. They want tangible bread in their hands. That's what they wanted. Jesus is talking about this bread from heaven. They weren't getting it. But he confronts their error in thinking when he says that miracles, when he's saying, what he's saying is that the miracles he did in the physical realm were not the end goal in and of themselves. That wasn't the point. Jesus didn't perform miracles as an end in themselves. Jesus he, com he committed these beautiful, um, loving acts of service to humanity in the miracles he performed. Think of all the things he did, but he did it for a reason. He didn't do it as an end to themselves. Lazarus died after he was raised from the dead. Jesus did it to point to the fact that he is the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the great I Am. He is the sustainer of the human heart. He is the gateway to eternal life. He is the, the sacrifice for man's sin when man could not save himself. He is the one 
does the work. From beginning to end, he is the great I am. Jesus is Lord. He's what they need. And he is what you need. You don't need the bread of prosperity here and now. Yes, God knows what you need and he'll give it to you. But your kingdom is not here. There is another kingdom that is imperishable, that will never spoil or fade, that comes at the finish line here. All those, Jesus continues in 37, that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. You see the goal? The goal is imperishable. This world and this realm we live in is perishable. You're going to succumb to disease, friends. You're not just going to get whisked away like Enoch or Elijah. Unless the Lord comes and raptures us, we're all going to the grave. How do you go to the grave? Your body breaks down. You're subject to physical diseases. You get old or some trauma happens. There's no guarantee that any of us are going to walk out of here today. There's no guarantee that any of us is going to make it home. Someone could come across the center line and hit you, and you'd be standing before the Lord right there, right now. There's no guarantees here. Everything here is perishable. Thank the Lord. I mean, I'm not that old, but I still ache in pain. You do too. And if you don't, you will. <laughs> this is why Jesus has told us that in this life that we have we'll have tribulations that we shouldn't let those things get us down because he has overcome all of these things in the present world that we would live and that, we would, and, and that he has plans to bring us into a new place to live with him with eternal bodies that will be incorruptible that will never ache and pain, spoil, fade away. Everlasting life for those who are His. Wow. We don't get it, do we? We're, we're kind of bound by these five senses that we have. And by faith you shall believe. We take these things by faith. And unless you have faith, you will not see God. That's the way He's created it. Jesus says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Did you hear that? This is good news. This is the gospel. This is what we live for. We live because He lives. We live because no matter what happens in this realm, no matter where we have to go, no matter what happens in this place, we have an eternal hope of everlasting life. And it's not just about what we're going to get when we get there. The reward is that we're going to be face to face with our God and Creator. Face to face. And we'll be with those that He, that he has called, who have answered the call, and who are following Him on the same path we are. Gathering the wheat into the barn. That's why he planted the harvest in the beginning. Not so that the harvest could just have their thing here. It's so that he can gather it into his barn. The Lord loves us. See, this isn't exactly what these people wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear this. There's going to be people out there, maybe you're on the internet listening to this, and you're like, Pastor, you're irritating me. Guess what? The Word of God's going to do that. The Word of God is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped 
for every good work. The Lord's design is that we learn. And sometimes we need to learn by teaching. Sometimes it's a little rebuke. Sometimes it's a big one. I don't know how many times I've had to have my butt kicked by God. I'm sure it's going to continue. You too. We need it. Because if we don't have it, we just go wandering off into the Thule's. God's not going to let us get away with stuff. He's going to te teach us. If Jesus, see, this wasn't what they wanted to hear. They wanted the blessings of bread here and now. They wanted Jesus to continue that miracle of physical provision so they could live on this cloud of dancing from goodness to goodness to goodness to goodness. The, the Persecution, trial, any kind of testing was not in the cards for them. They didn't want that. They wanted paradise here. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, this, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say now that I came down from heaven? Well, gee, they just witnessed him feed 10,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written by the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. There's no other way to, to God except through Jesus Christ, friends. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way unto the Father God except through him. It is written by the prophets. They all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one who has seen the Father except no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. See what he's trying to say here? But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And then Jesus began, the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? The Jews were listening to Jesus. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. He was speaking to them about spiritual things. Like those who embrace Christianity for the physical benefits they will receive from God as a result in this life. They totally got God's purposes wrong here. He had not come with the purpose of, of blessing them with physical miracles upon miracles all the time, every single day. Miracle upon miracle. Supernatural miracle upon supernatural miracle. Physical prosperity. No, that's not why he came. He does do that, but he always does it for a purpose. When God commits a miracle, when he does a miracle, it's always because he's trying to point someone towards Jesus. He's always trying to show himself for who he is as a lesson. But we want the bread. Come on, Jesus. Bring the manna like Moses gave us manna. Oh, Moses didn't actually give you the manna, people. It was God who gave it to you, and he gave it to you for a purpose, as a sign to you. But you will not believe, because you're thinking that the sign is something that it isn't. It's not about filling your bellies. It's about understanding who you serve, and how he holds eternity in his hands, and how nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Angels can't do it. Demons can't do it. Nothing can do it. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Hmm. See, Jesus drops a bomb on their presuppositions about his purpose. He'd come as G he has God's Passover lamb who would make a way for them to be forgiven. And whoever believed would not be perished but have everlasting life. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and they died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? So Jesus pours out a bucket of reality into the situation. The people who are looking at him just to fix their problems temporarily in this world are going to be offended. They're going to be offended. Because sometimes God says no. Yeah, he says yes sometimes. But sometimes he says no. That's not my plan. And it's not your decision. You and I are not God. We're not the great I am. He is. He knows what's best. He's sovereign over all, and he's good. We can trust him. Why? Because he's trustworthy. He always has been, and he always will be. Jesus didn't come so that people could jump from one miracle to the next. Those who embrace cultural Christianity for the sake of their own agenda, their own prosperity on the earth here, are pursuing Christianity for totally the wrong reason. Why? I want to know the Lord God and the power of His resurrection. Why? Because He is. I am not and He is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My life belongs to you, O God. My life is not my own. I was purchased with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. There is nothing that can separate me from your love, O God, because you are the great I am. You are the one who spoke into existence everything that is. You are the one who will raise those who believe in you at the last day, and you will bring them to everlasting life in your presence. You are also the one, O God, who will judge this world. So God, help us as Christians to be your light, to be your salt, to have your purposes, to have your mind, not to have our own, not to build a kingdom for ourselves here, but to see the kingdom of God established in the hearts of men and women all across this planet in the name of Jesus. This is our purpose. This is our calling. People of God, don't you see? Jesus told his disciples this. Jesus continues saying, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. You hear that? The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say this, is what I told you. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From that time, from this time, many disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? Because he wasn't the cosmic Santa Claus that they wanted. They wanted to be able to have it on tap. Whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted it, and however they wanted it, they wanted the control. It wasn't about God. It wasn't about knowing him. It wasn't about submitting to him. It wasn't about serving him. It was about filling their own barns, filling their own pockets with the treasuries of this world. And they turned back on Jesus because he didn't give them what they wanted. If God would bless them here and now, they would continue to follow him. If he didn't, they saw no benefit for themselves in following him and they abandoned him by the droves. It must have broken the heart of God to see the thousands of people who had seen him multiply the bread and the fish walk away. must have broke his heart. 67, and this is concluding it. You don't want to leave too, do you? He asked the 12. Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though he was one of the twelve, was later to betray him. My friends, may it not be said by us that we've been duped by the idea of cultural Christianity, where Jesus is our pudding cup that only is there to get us unlimited air miles so that we can fly around from one vacation to the next in this world. If it is, if Jesus is our pudding cup to us, we'll end up like those who walked away. Or even worse, where's my heart, God? Do I have a heart of Peter? He says, where else can we go? Where else shall we go, God? You have the words of life. Where's my heart bound by the flesh like Judas? Folks, I can't answer that question. Only that's between you and the Lord. But we see the truth and proclaim that Jesus' life was given to us as a sacrificial offering. His broken body and blood were poured out for mankind instead of the wrath of God coming upon us like we all deserve. The grace of God was given to us liberally in Jesus our Lord. Jesus, you have the word of eternal life. Where do we go? We've come to believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the bread of life that has come down from heaven. Jesus, that you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory, that there's nothing that you do not do, God, that does not have purpose. And your purpose, God, is that we might know you in the power of your resurrection and be gathered to you on that final day. We thank you, Lord, for the down payment that has been given to us in the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for meeting our physical needs as well as our emotional, mental needs, God, and our spiritual needs. You meet them, Lord. But sometimes, God, you let us go through suffering and trials of diverse kinds. And these have come so that the the faith that you're producing in us may be purified like gold in the fire. God, may we not look at things the way the world does. God, may we not be towed into cultural Christianity or towed into believing that that's the answer. Lord, help us to be followers of you. We praise you and we thank you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you in abundance this week. If you're here this morning and you need to pray, the prayer room's open. I would challenge you not to leave this place until you settle things with God. If you need to get things right with God, do it. If you don't know the Lord, please come talk to me after the service. Or talk to someone that is, you've come with today maybe that knows the Lord. If you're out there on the internet and you're listening to this message, you can receive the Lord if you believe in your heart that he is the Son of God and you confess him with your mouth and you're willing to walk away from your life of sin. You can come to the Lord and he will save you right away. You don't have to have a special ceremony or even have someone else pray with you. You can pray and you ask the Lord, to forgive you. Turn away from your old way and come to the living bread of life. Amen.